Part Two of Nodsons by H. Beam Piper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two. The big town was two hundred and fifty miles down the valley, at the forks of the main river, a veritable metropolis of almost three thousand people. That was where the treaty would have to be negotiated. But no two of them speak the same language. You'll want more huts, you'll want a water tank, and a pipeline to that stream below you, and a pump, Questel said. You think a month? Millard looked at Lillian Ransby. What do you think? Poodly doodly oodly foodle, she said. You saw how far we didn't get this afternoon. All we found out was that none of the standard procedures work at all. She made a tossing gesture over her shoulder. There goes the book. We'll have to do it off the cuff from here. Suppose we make another landing back in the mountains, say two or three hundred miles south of you, Vindenho said. It's not right to keep the rest aboard two hundred miles off planet, and you won't be wanting liberty parties coming down where you are. The country over there looks uninhabited, Millard said. No villages, anyhow. That wouldn't hurt at all. Well, it'll suit me, Charlie Logren, the xeno-naturalist, said. I want a chance to study the life forms in a state of nature. Vindenho nodded. Uh, Louis, do you anticipate any trouble with this crowd here? he asked. How about it, Mark? What do they look like to you? Warlike? No, he stated the opinion he had formed. I had a close look at their weapons when they came in for their presence. Hunting arms. Most of the spears have cross guards, usually wooden, lashed on, to prevent a wounded animal from running up the spear shaft at the hunter. They made boar spears like that on Terra a thousand years ago. Maybe they have to fight raiding parties from the hills once in a while, but not often enough for them to develop special fighting weapons or techniques. Their village is fortified, Millard mentioned. I question that, Gofredo differed. There won't be more than a total of five hundred there. Call that a fighting strength of two hundred. To defend a twenty-five hundred meter perimeter, with wood-choppers, axes, and bows and spears. If you notice, there's no wall around the village itself. That palisade is just a fence. Why would they mound the village up? Questel, in the screen, wondered. You don't think the river gets that high, do you? Because if it does— Schallenmacher shook his head. There just isn't enough watershed, and there's too much valley. I'd be very much surprised if that stream there— he nodded at the hundred power screen. Ever gets more than six inches over the bank. I don't know what those houses are built of. This is an alluvial country. Building stone would be almost unobtainable. I don't see anything like a brick kiln. I don't see any evidence of irrigation, either. So there must be plenty of rainfall. If they use adobe or sun-dried brick, houses would start to crumble in a few years and they would be pulled down and the rubble shoved aside to make room for a new house. The village has been rising on its own ruins, probably shifting back and forth from one end of that mound to the other. If that's it, they've been there a long time, Carl Dorber said. And how far have they advanced? Early bronze. I'll bet they still use a lot of stone implements. Pre-dynastic Egypt are very early Tigris-Euphrates in Terran terms. I can't see any evidence that they have the wheel. They have draft animals. When we were coming down I saw a few of them pulling pole trevoises. I'd say they've been farming for a long time. They have quite a diversity of crops, and I suspect that they have some idea of crop rotation. I'm amazed at their musical instruments. They seem to have put more skill into making them than anything else. I'm going to take a jeep while they're all in the village and have a look around the fields now. Charlie Longren went along for specimens and for the ride Lillian Ransby. Most of his guesses, he found, had been correct. He found a number of pole trevoises from which the animals had been unhitched in the first panic when the landing craft had been coming down. Some of them had big baskets permanently attached. 
There were drag marks everywhere in the soft ground, but not a single wheel track. He found one plow, cunningly put together with wooden pegs and rawhide lashings. The point was stone, and it would only score a narrow groove, not a proper furrow. It was, however, fitted with a big bronze ring to which a draft animal could be hitched. Most of the cultivation seemed to have been done with spades and hoes. He found a couple of each, bronze, cast flat in an open-top mold. They hadn't learned to make composite molds. There was an even wider variety of crops than he had expected. Two cereals, a number of different root plants, and a lot of different legumes, and things like tomatoes and pumpkins. Bet these people had a pretty good life here, before the Terrans came, Charlie observed. Don't say that in front of Paul, Lillian warned. He has enough to worry about now, without starting him on whether we'll do these people more harm than good. Two more landing craft had come down from the Hubert Penrose. They found Dave Questel superintending the unloading of more prefab huts, and two were already up that had been brought down with the first landing. A name for the planet had also arrived. Svandivit. Carl Dorver told him, principal god of the Baltic Slavs, about three thousand years ago. Guy Vindinho dug it out of the Encyclopedia of Mythology. Svantobit was represented as holding a bow in one hand and a horn in the other. Well, that fits. What will we call the natives? Svantovitians or Svantovies? Well, Paul wanted to call them Svantovies, but Lewis persuaded him to call them Svants. He said everybody would call them that anyhow, so we might as well make it official from the start. We can call the language Svantavis, Lillian decided. After dinner I am going to start playing back recordings and running off audio-visuals. I will be so happy to know that I have a name for what I am studying. Probably all I will know. After dinner he and Carl and Paul went into a huddle on what sort of gifts to give the natives, and the advisability of trading with them, and for what. Nothing too far in advance of their present culture level. Wheels. They could be made in the fabricating shop aboard the ship. You know, it's odd, Carl Dorver said. These people here have never seen a wheel and, except in documentary or historical drama films, neither have a lot of Terrans. That was true. As a means of transportation, the wheel had been completely obsolete since the development of contragravity six centuries ago. Well, a lot of Terrans in the year zero had never seen a suit of armor, or an harquebus, or even a tinder box or a spinning wheel. Wheelbarrows. Now there was something they'd find useful. He screened Max Milzer, in charge of the fabricating and repair shops on the ship. Max had never even heard of a wheelbarrow. I can make them up, Mark. Better send me some drawings, though. Did you just invent it? As far as I know, a man named Leonardo da Vinci invented it in the sixth century pre-atomic. How soon can you get me a half dozen of them? Well, let's see. A welded sheet metal and a pipe for the frame and handles. I'll have some of them for you by noon tomorrow. Now, about hoes. How tall are these people, and how long are their arms, and how far can they stoop over?" They were all up late that night. So were the swans. There was a fire burning in the middle of the village, and watch-fires along the edge of the mound. Louis Cofredo was just as distrustful of them as they were of the Terrans. He kept the camp lighted, a strong guard on the alert, and the area of darkness beyond infrared lighted and covered by photoelectric sentries on the ground and snoopers in the air. Like Paul Millard, Louis Goffredo was a worrier and a pessimist. Everything happened for the worst in this worst of all possible galaxies, and if anything could conceivably go wrong, it infallibly would. That was probably why he was still alive and had never had a command massacred. The wheelbarrows, four of them, came down from the ship by mid-morning. With them came a grindstone, a couple of cross-cut saws, and a lot of picks and shovels and axes, 
and cases of sheath knives and mess gear and miscellaneous trade goods, including a lot of the empty wine and whiskey bottles that had been hoarded for the past four years. At lunch the talk was almost exclusively about the language problem. Lillian Ransby, who had not gotten to sleep before sunrise and had just gotten up, was discouraged. "'I don't know what we're going to do next,' she admitted. "'Glenn Orant and Anna and I were on it all night, and we're nowhere. We have about a hundred word-like sounds isolated, and twenty or so are used repeatedly, and we can't assign a meaning to any of them. And none of the Svants ever reacted the same way twice to anything we said to them. There's just no one-to-one -one relationship anywhere. I'm beginning to doubt they have a language, the Navy intelligence officer said. Sure, they make a lot of vocal noise. So do chipmunks. They have to have a language, Anna de Jong declared. No sapient thought is possible without verbalization. Well, no society like that is possible without some means of communication. Carl Dorver supported her from the other flank. He seemed to have made that point before. You know, he added, I'm beginning to wonder if it mightn't be telepathy. He evidently hadn't suggested that before. The others looked at him in surprise. Anna started to say, Oh, I doubt if— and then stopped. I know the race of telepaths is an old gimmick that's been used in new planet adventure stories for centuries, but maybe we finally found one. I don't like it, Carl, Logren said. If they're telepaths, why don't they understand us? And if they're telepaths, why do they talk at all? And you can't convince me that this boodly oodly doodle of theirs isn't talking. Well, our neural structure and theirs won't be nearly alike, Phaon said. I know this analogy between telepathy and radio is full of holes, but it's good enough for this. Our wavelength can't be picked up with their sets. The deuce it can't, Gofredo contradicted. I've been bothered about that from the beginning. These people act as though they got meaning from us. Not the meaning we intend, but some meaning. Uh, when Paul made the gobbledygook speech, they all reacted in the same way, frightened and then defensive. The you-me routine simply bewildered them, as we'd be at a set of semantically lucid but self-contradictory statements. When Lillian tried to introduce herself, they were shocked and horrified. It looked to me like actual physical disgust, Anna interpolated. When I tried it, they acted like a lot of puppies being petted, and when Mark tried it, they were simply baffled. I watched Mark explaining that steel knives were dangerously sharp. They got the demonstration. But when he tried to tie words onto it, it threw them completely. All right, past that, Logren conceded. But if they have telepathy, why do they use spoken words? Oh, I can answer that, Anna said. Say they communicated by speech originally and developed their telepathic faculty slowly and without realizing it. They'd go on using speech. And since the message would be received telepathically ahead of the spoken message, nobody would pay any attention to the words as such. Everybody would have a spoken language of his own. It would be a sort of instrumental accompaniment to the song. Some of them don't bother speaking, Carl nodded. They just toot. I'll buy that right away, Logren agreed. In mating or in group danger situations, telepathy would be a race survival characteristic. It would be selected for genetically, and the non-gifted strains would tend to die out. It wouldn't do. It wouldn't do at all. He said so. Look at their technology. We either have a young race, just emerged from savagery or an old stagnant race. All indications seem to favor the latter. A young race would not have time to develop telepathy as Anna suggests. An old race would have gone much farther than these people have. Progress is a matter of communication and pooling ideas and discoveries. Make a trend graph of technological progress on Terra. Every big jump 
comes after an improvement in communications. The printing press, railways and steamships, the telegraph, radio. Then think how telepathy would speed up the progress. The sun was barely past noon meridian before the savants, who had ventured down into the fields at sunrise, were returning to the mound village. In the snooper screen they could be seen coming up in tunics and breech clouts, entering houses and emerging in long robes. There seemed to be no bows or spears in evidence, but the big horn sounded occasionally. Paul Millard was pleased. Even if it had been by sign-talk, which he raided with worm-fishing for trout or shooting sitting rabbits, he had gotten something across to them. When they went to the village at 1500, they had trouble getting their lorry down. A couple of marines in a jeep had to go in first to get the crowd out of the way. Several of the locals, including the one with the staff, joined with them. This quick cooperation delighted Millard. When they had the lorry down and were all out of it, the dignitary with the staff, his scarlet tablecloth over his yellow robe, began an oration, apparently with every confidence that he was being understood. In spite of his objections at lunch, the telepathy theory was beginning to seem more persuasive. "'Give them the shooting of Dan McJabberwocky again,' he told Millard. "'This is where we came in yesterday.' Something Millard had noticed was exciting him. Wait a moment. They're going to do something. They were indeed. The one with the staff and three of his henchmen advanced. The staff-bearer touched himself on the brow. Fwonk, he said. Then he pointed to Millard. Hawky, he said. They got it. Lillian was hugging herself joyfully. I knew they ought to. Millard indicated himself and said, Fwonk. That wasn't right. The village elder immediately corrected him. The word, it seemed, was Fwonk. His three companions agreed that that was the word for self, but that was as far as the agreement went. They rendered it respectively as Poink, Tweelt, and Klush. Gofredo gave a barking laugh. He was right. Anything that could go wrong would go wrong. Lillian used a word. It was not a ladylike word at all. The savants looked at them as though wondering what could possibly be the matter. Then they went into a huddle, arguing vehemently. The argument spread like a ripple in a pool. Soon everybody was twittering vocally and blowing on flutes and panpipes. Then the big horn started blaring. Immediately, Gofredo snatched the handphone of his belt radio and began speaking urgently into it. "'What are you doing, Louis?' Millard asked anxiously. "'Calling the reserve in. I'm not taking chances on this.' He spoke again into the phone, then called over his shoulder. Uh, Renette, three one-second bursts in the air. A Marine pointed a submachine-gun skyward and ripped off a string of shots, then another and another. There was silence after the first burst. Then a frightful howling arose. Louis, you imbecile! Millard was shouting. Gofredo jumped onto the top of an air jeep where they could all see him, drawing his pistol. He fired it twice into the air. Be quiet, all of you, he shouted, as though that would do any good. It did. Silence fell, bounced noisily, and then settled over the crowd. Gofredo went on talking to them. Take it easy now, easy. He might have been speaking to a frightened dog or a fractious horse. Nobody's going to hurt you. This is nothing but the great noise magic of the Terrans. Get the presents unloaded, Millard was saying. Make a big show of it. The table first. The horn, which had started, stopped blowing. As they were getting off the long table and piling it with trade goods, another lorry came in, disgorging twenty marine riflemen. They had their bayonets fixed. The natives looked apprehensively at the bare steel, but went on listening to Gofredo. Millard pulled the 
Lord Mayor, Archbishop, Lord of the Manor, aside, and began making sign talk to him. When quiet was restored, Howell put a pick and shovel into a wheelbarrow and pushed them out into the space that had been cleared in front of the table. He swung the pick for a while, then shoveled the barrow full of ground. After pushing it around for a while, he dumped it back in the hole and leveled it off. Two marines brought out an eight-inch log and chopped a couple of billets off it with an axe, then cut off another one with the saws, split them, and filled the wheelbarrow with the firewood. We can't use the computer till we can tell it what the data is data about. The knives, jewelry, and other small items would be no problem. They had enough of them to go around. The other stuff would be harder to distribute, and Paul Millard and Carl Dorver were arguing about how to handle it. If they weren't careful, a lot of new Bowie knives would get bloodied. Have them form a queue, Anna suggested. That will give them the idea of equal sharing, and we'll be able to learn something about their status levels and social hierarchy and agonistic relations. The one with the staff took it as a matter of course that he would go first. His associates began falling in behind him, and the rest of the villagers behind them. Whether they'd gotten one the day before or not, everybody was given a knife and a bandana and one piece of flashy junk jewelry, also a stainless steel cup and mess plate, a bucket, and an empty bottle with a cork. The women didn't carry sheath knives, so they got Boy Scout knives on lanyards. They were all lavishly supplied with XT-3 and candy. Any of the children who looked big enough to be trusted with them got knives, too, and plenty of candy. Anna and Carl were standing where the queue was forming, watching how they fell into line. So was Lillian with an audio-visual camera. Having seen that the Marine enlisted men were getting the presents handed out properly, Howell strolled over to them, just as he came up. A couple approached hesitantly, a man in a breech-clout under a leather apron, and a woman much smaller in a ragged and soiled tunic. As soon as they fell into line, another svant in a blue robe pushed them aside and took their place. "'Here, you can't do that!' Lillian cried. "'Carl, make him step back.' Carl was saying something about social status and precedence. The couple tried to get into line behind the man who had pushed them aside. Another villager tried to shove them out of his way. Howell advanced, his right fist closing. Then he remembered that he didn't know what he'd be punching. He might break the fellow's neck or his own knuckles. He grabbed the blue-robed Svant by the wrist with both hands, kicked a foot out from under him, and jerked, sending him flying for six feet, and then sliding in the dust for another couple of yards. He pushed the others back and put the couple into place in their line. "'Mark, you shouldn't have done that,' Dorfer was expostulating. "'We don't know—' The Svant sat up, shaking his head groggily. Then he realized what had been done to him. With a snarl of rage he was on his feet, his knife in his hand. It was a Terran bowie knife. Without conscious volition, Howell's pistol was out and he was thumbing the safety off. The Svant stopped short, then dropped the knife, ducked his head, and threw his arms over it to shield his comb. He backed away a few steps, then turned and bolted into the nearest house. The others, including the woman in the ragged tunic, were twittering in alarm. Only the man in the leather apron was calm. He was saying tonelessly, Grog, Grog. Louis Gofredo was coming up on the double, followed by three of his riflemen. What happened, Mark? Trouble? All over now. He told Gofredo what had happened. Darver was still objecting. Social precedents. The savant may have been right, according to local customs. Local customs be damned, Gofredo became angry. This is a Terran Federation handout. We make the rules and one of them is no pushing people out of line. Teach the buggers that now, and we won't have to work so hard at it later." He called back over his shoulder. "'Situation under control. Get the show going again.' 
The natives were all grimacing heartbrokenly with pleasure. Maybe the one who got thrown on his ear—no, he didn't have any—was not one of the more popular characters in the village. "'You just pulled your gun, and he dropped the knife and ran?' Gofredo asked. "'And the others were scared, too?' "'That's right. They all saw you fire yours. The noise scared them.' Gofredo nodded. "'We'll avoid promiscuous shooting, then. No use letting them find out the noise won't hurt them any sooner than we have to.' Paul Millard had worked out a way to distribute the picks and shovels and axes. Considering each house as representing a family unit, which might or might not be the case, there were picks and shovels enough to go around, and an axe for every third house. They took them around in an air jeep and left them at the doors. The houses, he found, weren't adobe at all. They were built of logs, plastered with adobe on the outside. That demolished his theory that the houses were torn down periodically and left the mound itself unexplained. The wheelbarrows and the grindstone and the two cross-cut saws were another matter. Nobody was quite sure that the nobility, capitalist class, politicians, prominent citizens wouldn't simply appropriate them for themselves. Paul Millard was worried about that. Everybody else was willing to let matters take their course. Before they were off the ground in their vehicles, a violent dispute had begun, with a bedlam of jabbering and shrieking. By the time they were landing at the camp, the big laminated leather horn had begun to bellow. End of Part Two